Hey everyone, uh, I'm Megan Cook. I'm so excited to be connected with you today. Uh, three, two, one, we're live. Here we go. Uh, welcome to Earth Live Lessons. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here to chat with you a little bit about my work. Uh, I am a deep ocean explorer and the manager of education partnerships and programs for Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, if you're watching along with me live, feel free to drop your questions and comments down into the field below. I'll answer as many of those as I can as we get to the end of this. Um, as an ocean explorer, I have the incredible job of working with a team who is working to go to places that have never, ever been seen before on planet Earth and share that with uh, the entire world as we do it. We'd have pretty cool jobs if we just did that for ourselves, but an essential part of our mission is developing the technology and tools that it takes to get to these faraway places. I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but also to bring other people along on these adventures with us, to share our exploration and inspire students into the types of careers that it takes uh, to put together a mission team like ours at Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, so I want to chat a little bit about how I got started in this work, and then we'll talk about some of the tools and um, technologies that we use to go down to these places that are fairly inhospitable for humans uh, but on our planet. So a bit about me. I am one of those people who has loved the ocean uh, as long as I can remember. Uh, however, I did not grow up anywhere near the ocean. Um, I am from uh, Boise, Idaho, USA, which is firmly in the middle of the desert. Um, I, the ocean was really alive for me in storybooks and in school. So I have one of those fantastic teachers, um, Mrs. Dell, uh, my first grade teacher, Pioneer Elementary School, go uh, Pioneers, uh, where she really integrated the ocean into a lot that we learned and thank you to my parents for getting me a library card because I became one of those kids who loved the ocean whether or not it was part of my day-to-day -day life. I think a lot of kids want to be marine biologists when they grow up and I certainly am one of those people. Uh, the marine, being a marine biologist was the only job I knew of that could take me to the ocean so that's what I did. I studied biology, chemistry, marine biology at school and uh, ended up pursuing that path as a scuba diver, um, as an operations manager, figuring out how to get people to where science needed to happen. I really liked all of those puzzles that went into how do we understand the planet? How do we see what's going on? But also a really important part of my work always was sharing it with my friends and family who lived super far away from the ocean. And that's how I really got interested, I think, in working with the team, uh, with the Ocean Exploration Trust and the team that I work with now. Combining those passions for understanding the planet, uh, having new tools and tricks that are really neat and that we get to try out and have that experimentation and adventure of going out into the natural world. And then also uh, sharing it with everybody as we go along. So let's talk about the ocean a little bit. Um, I am in my office here, uh, not a lot of ocean in the background, but um, if we were to take a globe and we were to spin it around and you were to drop your finger on it, three times out of four, if you just closed your eyes and stopped your finger on it, uh, you would land in water. Our planet is blue and salty. Although we spend most of our time as humans on the kind of dry, dusty parts of the planet, 71% of Earth is covered in water. Now, it surprises a lot of people still to find out that on a planet that is that blue, that is such a major part of our entire life support system for how we exist on this planet, that we have so little of our ocean explored to date. In fact, 95%, yep, 95% uh, percent of our ocean is still unexplored, which is mind-blowing. Um, I always just have such a tough time wrapping my brain around that fact. Um, but there's a few factors that come in here and I wanna talk you through them and share some of those, some of, the, some of the challenges and then how we overcome some of those challenges to work in this environment. Um, mostly the ocean is big. As I mentioned, it covers uh, three quarters of our planet and the ocean is deep. Uh, you can get several, hundred mi uh, several miles deep, um, thousands of meters deep in the ocean. And uh, water is cold, 
it's dark and it presents just some sort of natural challenges to being people who really like breathing air, um, really like staying in sort of like a Goldilocks zone of temperature. Um, we need to uh, come up with technology and come up with tools that'll help us get beyond the places where you can put on a mask and snorkel, maybe a scuba tank um, and go see the ocean. I love those parts of the ocean, but those aren't the parts that are unexplored. Mostly you have to focus on those deeper, farther away from the shore parts of, um, of the ocean to find those unexplored parts. So the first tool uh, we have in our toolbox as explorers is our ship. So this is exploration vessel Nautilus. Uh, she's owned and operated by Ocean Exploration Trust. She's 211 feet long, home to 48 explorers at a time. Um, on board this ship, we work 24 hours a day. So we divide up into teams on a ship. You'd call those watches. Uh, and we stand a four on, eight off watch schedule, which means you go into the control rooms up here on the top deck four hours at a time. Uh, four hours later, another team comes up and relieves you. So you might be the, let's say, uh, midnight to 4 a.m. and noon to 4 p.m. or 4 to 8 or 8 to 12 team on board. Um, on board that ship, that which lets us go all over the world, um, Ocean Exploration Trust has owned and operated this ship for 10 years. So we've moved from the Black Sea, Mediterranean, Aegean, across the Atlantic, through the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, through the Panama Canal, and out into the Pacific, as far north as nearly to Alaska, as far south as Ecuador, out into the Central Pacific, um, really targeting those areas that are poorly understood or totally un not explored left on our planet. One of the other tools that you really want as an explorer when you, when you get started um, is a map. It's very difficult to know what is explored and what is not explored. Where would you wanna put your tools into the ocean if you're trying to um, solve a question or just understand what's there without a map? Map is step number one. Um, a lot of people are surprised to learn that uh, in addition to our oceans not being explored, meaning not being seen with human eyes, they're also not very well mapped. Uh, if we think about for a second, how would we make a map? If you wanted to walk around your neighborhood and make a map, you would probably use your eyes. Right? You would visually look out over the landscape, uh, look for landmarks, maybe things like streets, um, houses, maybe natural landmarks like a hill over here and a valley over here. If we want to look at the bottom of the ocean, we can't see it, right? There's a lot of water in the way. So that means, uh, let's think about another tool we could use to make a map. If you've used Google Maps and, you know, zoomed in on your neighborhood or on your house, uh, you've probably seen a satellite map. So a satellite map, again, either takes pictures or uses um, electromagnetic energy to detect what you can see there. Tough problem in the ocean, water is very dense and it absorbs a lot of electromagnetic radiation. So that means we can't use satellites to get a very good picture of the seafloor. You can sort of get an estimation. So if you go onto Google Maps and look out into the ocean and see those, uh, the shapes of the earth in the ocean, there are some shapes there. Um, but you're missing a lot of detail. We like to call that like a wet tablecloth view of the ocean, where you would maybe, um, if you had set a beautiful dinner table for yourself uh, with plates and forks and spoons and serving bowls and glasses, and then you just threw a wet tablecloth over it, you'd sort of get the shapes, right? You'd get the idea of what was under there, but you'd be missing a lot of the detail of what's there. So let's see, if we can't use visual and we can't use our satellites, uh, what we have to use is sound. So when we map the seafloor, what we do from the ship, uh, from the bottom of the ship, there's a hull mounted, what we call multi-beam mapping sonar um, from Comsberg, and it emits sound down to the seafloor. You can measure how uh, long it takes until you hear that sound back. It's like an echo. So you bounce sound down from the seafloor, wait and listen for it to bounce and come back. And by knowing the speed the sound is traveling in between, uh, that lets you know how far the sound traveled. If it comes back quickly, you're in shallower water. If it comes back, it takes longer to come back, 
deeper water. But instead of just sending one ping, modern tools sent uh, 864 uh, soundings in a single pulse. So we end up getting a fan shape of the seafloor and being able to cover a lot of ground as we are mapping the seafloor. Here's a, a, we have a patch design contest every year and this was the winning design a few years ago. And you can really see that mapping system. So the idea of a fan shaped sound going down, hitting the seafloor, and then the rainbow colors are how we estimate um, or how we visualize the seafloor. So warm colors like reds are shallower on the way down to deeper colors. Once you have a map, now we can really decide where we wanna go exploring. So the tools we use to go down to the seafloor are called remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. Uh, and we give them names because it's a lot easier to sort of give them uh, a little bit of personality when you work with a tool like this. So we have, um, typically we've had two, ROV Hercules and ROV Argus, who work as a team. Very exciting news in our world. We just developed two more robots. So we have Little Hercules and Atalanta now in our team. Uh, I have some pictures of them, but they're perhaps not shockingly in pretty dark. Uh, this is ROV Hercules on the seafloor. Um, I'd rather use something a little easier to see for you all. So I made a little... Uh, Made a little Lego ROV Hercules for us today. It's silly, but it has some of the right features as you go along. ROV Hercules is a lot bigger than this. It was 5,600 pounds and is about the size of um, maybe like a small van or a Jeep. But some of the features are the same. ROV Hercules has lights. As we work in the deep sea, you have to bring your own light down to the seafloor. So there's a whole panel, um, we call it kind of like an eyebrow bar or a bump bar. Um, it is the uh, light bar on the front of Hercules to shine down. In our configuration, ROV Argus would be above Hercules and connected to the ship. So these are robots on leashes. You can think about kind of like a dog on a leash or we call it a tether. So these would be ROVs on a tether. They're connected continuously to the ship so that we can see the video from them. They have 13 cameras on them on the seafloor. So we can look in all directions uh, and get both good situational awareness, which is uh, sort of like how are the ROVs in space? How are they maneuvering near any features of the seafloor? Whether those are um, volcanoes or chimneys or canyons or beautiful big corals that we wanna make sure we don't disturb. Um, so those cameras are really helpful for us looking around. And they also collect some of our most important data that we bring back from the seafloor, which is who's there? What does it look like? How big are things? Um, what's the biodiversity? What kind of animals um, or landscapes did we see as we were there? So cameras, lights, very important. We also have um, manipulator arms. This is so funny. Uh, two manipulator arms, just like my model. Uh, I like to say Hercules is right-handed because the right arm is much more dexterous, meaning it's much better at doing um, small tasks, uh, delicate maneuvers, things like snipping uh, one branch off of a coral if we wanna bring a sample back to the surface with us. Uh, using scoops, using thermometers and magnets um, to pick up different things on the seafloor as we're operating. Uh, the right arm is very strong and very good at holding uh, heavy things, but those two arms in combination mean that we can uh, not only just observe on the seafloor, but bring back a lot of information about the types of things that we find. Other features of our robot, of our ROV here, would be our thrusters. Only fit two onto this model, but um, ROV Hercules has six. There are paired thrusters that help it move either um, forward and back, side to side, or up and down, and can be used in combination. They're flown with a joystick box, so uh, a lot of people like to learn that. The, it looks a little bit like a, um, a little like a game controller, but a whole lot more complicated than that. So all of the people in our operations stay safely on the ship, working in that watch schedule, that rotation, which means we can stay well rested. Robots don't need to eat or sleep or go to the bathroom. So once we send them down to the deep sea, they can stay there for hours and hours on end, um, which makes us very efficient at exploring the seafloor. Uh, when we go out on our missions, we spend um, about six months generally at sea, uh, broken up into 
about a dozen different expeditions. So that'll mean we're visiting different regions of an ocean basin along the way, uh, sometimes answering different questions, but often just investigating. Exploration is so important because it is the step before science really starts, before research and asking those questions. In order to say, you know, how is something changing? Or uh, has something always been here? You have to have a baseline to start from. And exploration of the deep sea is still at the stage where we are creating the basic understandings of how the system is working on our planet. I love uh, getting to work with these tools and getting to use this technology um, because it's always changing. ROV Hercules was originally built, let's see, about 20 years ago. But it's hard to say that Hercules actually has a birthday per se, because you can always change out the equipment on board. So we're constantly putting different sensors, different samplers, different types of tools on and off the ROVs, depending on where we're going, what types of things we think we might encounter, because you never really know when you're exploring something new for the first time. Uh, and that keeps uh, the robot both um, new, sort of regenerated, I guess you could say, um, but also means that we're constantly uh, getting to help move other scientists and technology partners' uh, ideas along because we spend so long at sea. So we have the chance to bring things out, trial them. Chances are they won't work out perfectly the first time. That's just real. Do some more work and then take them back out into the sea again. And I love being part of that and letting the world be part of that through our website um, and social media. Uh, trying those things, failing, trying again. Uh, I think that's really a powerful part of our work and I love it. What kinds of things do we see on the seafloor? There's lots of folks asking, have we ever seen a giant squid? I have not seen a giant squid, but I would love to. What kind of life do we come across at hydrothermal vents? You guys, hydrothermal vents are the coolest landscape. It is the place where the skin of the planet is tearing open as two tectonic plates move apart. The heat of the earth is heating up water with rocks and minerals and that chemical energy is releasing out in clouds into the ocean um, and it creates habitat for so many cool types of life on those spots. Um, there are giant tube worms at some sites. There are little itty bitty like hair like tube worms at some, but you also see shrimp, crabs, fish, sharks, all kinds of life thriving in this totally dark, totally chemically intense landscape. I just love it. Um, we have also seen um, there's just amazing life in the deep sea. I think that's something that people maybe uh, have as a misconception in their mind is just because this place is far away, it's dark, it's very inhospitable to us, that it would be inhospitable to other life there. And we get to see remarkable creatures. And I totally recommend you check out our YouTube, which is linked down here below for thousands of videos of cool discoveries that we've made. Um, some of my favorites include a jellyfish that looks like a uh, a firework. I just love that one. We have slow motion seven gill sharks. We had a surprise visit from one of the largest hunters in the ocean, the sperm whale, a few years ago that I was so lucky to be on board for. Um, another one of my favorites is the vampire squid that puff out their um, webbed tentacles, sort of like a circus tent, and capture the water and capture prey in that way. There are so many remarkable um, moments that we've gotten to see but again, what's most important to me is that I didn't just get to see them. Um, we get to share them with everybody in the world who's watching live, kind of like you're watching live right now, um, or who tunes in a little bit later. Uh, the deepest our ROVs can go is 4,000 meters for ROV Hercules. It's 6,000 meters, brand new 6,000 meters um, for Argus and Atalanta and Little Hercules. So we're really excited for that new technology capacity. Um, we can get to half the world's ocean is shallower than 4,000 meters and about 90% of the world's ocean is shallower than 6,000 meters. So we certainly will not run out of things to explore anytime soon. Just to wrap up, as we get ready to um, finish this up today, I just wanna tell you that there are, it will never, ever, ever be a generation of explorers more important and more famous than the ones that are starting right now. So if you are interested in this, um, don't let anything curb your enthusiasm and your passion and your curiosity for this. It doesn't matter where you grew up, 
uh, what kind of career path you want to go down. The most, you know, one of the most important tools to help us get this work done is the team. I get to chat with you here today, but I'm here representing uh, over 1,200 members of our core of exploration who are not just scientists, but they're engineers, they're technology specialists, they're filmmakers, they're educators, students, professional mariners who all come together, collaborate together, and get this work done. Um, None of this would be possible. None of the videos that I hope you're all checking out from the links below would be possible without that teamwork and without it all coming together. So know that the planet needs you. We need to understand this blue planet that we live on. And in order to do that, we have to start off at the basic level, which is just going out and exploring the world that we live in. So do tune in. There are going to be a lot more um, Earth Live lessons. And do tune in with us as we launch our 2020 Nautilus expedition this summer. Uh, you can explore with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, through our live feed and also through our social media where you can see some behind the scenes takeovers from our team and submit any questions that I didn't get to today um, through our website because we answer questions live through there. I think that is all for now. So subscribe to uh, Earth Live Lessons for more and check out all of the links below. And I can't wait to keep exploring the oceans with you all soon. Take care.